Good morning, Fancy Meat Computers. How's everybody doing today? It's, uh, this is, oh man. That was, eh. Not the greatest way to start off a stream, eh? Anyway. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, before we get into our uh, lecture material for today, I wanted to uh, just discuss this... Uh... Oh, that's the wrong announcement feed. I'm looking. You guys would be like, what is that? That's not what we're doing. Um, let's see. There's an announcement, and I said to the CS Society that I'd bring it up in class, so here we go. Um... <clears throat> So apparently the uh, Computer Science C Society is uh, looking for some class reps. Um, so if you're interested 
in uh, bringing uh, your skills to the table with respect to representing your class, then, uh, you know, you have an opportunity to do so. Um, how's my day been so far? Well, it's been rainy, you know. Ugh. Um... Yeah, it's kind of like the, uh, the, um, the kind of slow morning you have after having stayed up a bit too late to watch the election results come in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, uh, the president of the Computer Science Society is recruiting year representatives for their team, and, um, yep. I'm speaking about this now. Quick summary of what they were hoping for me to talk about. Uh, they're hiring year reps and applications are out now. There's the link. The forum is also on Discord if you're a Discord type person. As a CS Society year representative, you will be responsible for actively communicating with computer science students to determine ways to improve student life. Um, as a professor, I would, I would throw communicating with the professors as well. Um, Sometimes I've had uh, class reps that have actually, um, you know, had a profound impact on the manner in which the semester has gone, last semester in particular. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I view this to be a much more important role if you're actually communicating with people correctly. Um, the election was a rerun. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yep. It's like, can somebody please explain to me why this was why this was necessary? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> yes. So, uh, yes. So you would have to attend weekly meetings, relay information to your peers, attending some super fun events, or planning some of your own, being a voice for your year. Applications are due this Friday. So there you go. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to make any, but the most general of comments about the election because, uh, you know, I'm, uh, in something of a, you know, trusted leadership position and it's not correct for me to have a political opinion while teaching class, so. Except for the fact that the results of this election seem to be startlingly similar to the results of the last election, so it seems I think it I think it's a nonpartisan stance that the whole thing seems to be a huge waste of money, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> so that's that's our announcements for today. Um, so let's get into our material. Um, in my estimation, we're a little bit behind with the material, so we should uh, we should get to and start plugging away at this so that we can uh, eventually, hopefully, get to the interesting stuff. Uh, <laughs> maybe, you're, oh, maybe you're finding this stuff interesting. Hopefully. Uh, I try to make things that are not interesting interesting, so... Um, <clears throat> There we go. We will need a terminal. There we go. Um, let's see. Just trying to optimize my layout. There. I think that's optimal. Python 3. There we go. So. Lisa won't hear. So the next one. Yeah. Yes. Um, what if this was a political science class? Well, I, I still think that it's uh, it's correct for even in a political science class for the uh, for the uh, actual professor to be nonpartisan, you know, but uh, <laughs> demand the Cambrian explosion. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, so a question. Why the hand brace? Uh, because I've been uh, I've been working so hard lately that uh, I've given myself a repetitive strain injury in my wrist that, uh, you know, if 
allowed to persist. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, if you let carpal tunnel syndrome get too bad, then they actually have to do surgery to, uh, uh, to correct it, and it results in permanent nerve damage. So I just thought I'd, uh, you know, I'd wear the brace for a week or two, and hopefully that'll knock it on its head. Demand the Cambrian explosion. Listen, Mark, you're not allowed to tell them to ask me about things that are my secret passions, okay? Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, um, um, I don't know if it's political science they call the dismal science, but one of those, one of those, it's either, um, it's either poli-sci or, or social sciences they call the dismal silent, the dismal science. But, uh, yeah, it's okay. Everything's under control. I got myself a very, uh, very swoopy ergonomic keyboard, so that'll also help relieve my, my, my wrist strain. But, uh, yeah. Cool. It's a look. Yeah, I should get, I should get a matching one for the other one, eh? I can be like, you know, I could, I should put spikes on it like Batman. Um, Yeah. are my thoughts on the industrial revolution um hand stretches yeah yeah i I'll, I'll, i have been looking into it um okay ask me tomorrow because after class tomorrow i will have like a sp I, I i have some time after class that i'll be able to talk to you about the cambrian explosion um but uh yeah for now, let's learn some computer science. So, <clears throat> comments. So, we're, um, when we're programming, when we're writing a program, it doesn't come up so much when you're doing, like, just using the interpreter, but when you're actually writing out a program like you would be doing during the assignments, it is often useful to be able to leave little notes to yourself and to others. So we have in computing, uh, pretty much every single computing language that I have ever used has these. Um, you have a thing called a comment. So what a comment is, is you put a, um, you just, oh my God, that's the worst font. That's the worst font coloring. Try it in, get it. That's a little less oppressive to my eyes. So, when you want to insert something, describe something that's going on in the code, you leave the comment character. In Python, that's the octothorpe character, also known as the pound sign, also known as the hashtag. Uh, and you can just type freely, type freely uh, any English thing or anything in any language that you like. So, this function does very little it seems. So what happens with these comments is that when the computer runs through and compiles your program or interprets your program, comments are simply ignored. They are ignored by the program that runs your program. So you can basically write anything you want in them. There are, you know, some good practices when it comes to writing comments for sure. Uh, in general, there's kind of a rule of thumb, like the, the thing that, uh, the convenient lie that's often told to first year students is that the more comments you have in your code, the better. Uh, the actual truth is that it is definitely possible to over comment your code. Um, and in general, uh, there there is such a thing as programming in a style where your um, your uh, need for comments is less than it might be. Uh, like, for example, using descriptive variable and function names can, uh, you know, reduce the need for documentation. However, uh, it's better to err on the side of more documentation as opposed to less. Um, you should um, you should document things. Uh, bec there are a number of reasons for documentation, and most of them come come down to like 
when you're working on programs in the real world and not working on assignment questions, uh, generally it will be the case that you'll have to come back to the code that you've written many times over the course of a period of time, say weeks, months, or years, or even decades. Um, so um, it's useful in that sense to be able to, uh, you know, have some notes to yourself about what the hell is going on. Um, do you get grading ba grades based on commenting? Uh, in general, no. Um, however, uh, every once in a while I like to throw a question in that asks for a very specific style of comment called a doc string. Uh, so you can actually write comments in, in Python in such a way to hook them up with uh, Python's inbuilt help function. Um, every once in a while I throw that on a test just to, just to throw you off. Um, it's kind of fun because you have to like capture the output stream and uh, scan it for keywords in order to assign grades based on that. But Oh yeah, decades for sure. Um, yeah, like you'd be surprised how old a lot of the co code that's floating around is. You know, did you think, like, do you think that uh, every time uh, Microsoft uh, releases a new version of Windows, they write the whole thing from scratch? <laughs> Right. Mm. Oh, economics is the dis dismal science. There we go. I knew it was one of those. I knew it was one of those. Um, um, so, again, we're not going to be grading for comments, but they're still a good idea. And, you know, the auto grader doesn't know how to look for them. So that's why we're not grading for them. But uh, still a very good thing to know how to do. So, yes. Um, this is a little bit verbose. But, um, like, for me, I think the only, the only really, the only uh, valuable comment here is the first one. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Mm. So, yes. So, comments. Comments are good. Use comments. So, um, I thought Bill was in the back hack, hacking away at his keyboard. Man, I'm sure that that guy hasn't written one P... I, like, I don't think he's written three statements of code since the 80s. Like, honestly. Bill Gates is a much better businessman than he is a programmer. Uh, <laughs> what are doc strings? I'll show you briefly. We have some slides on it coming up, but I'll show you briefly. So if you want to document a function, um, if you use uh, triple quotes, anything inside of the triple quotes, this will show up as help information. So if you then down here, uh, let's just get rid of that. Incidentally, commenting is also a really, really useful skill for toggling whether or not code is be going to be used or not. So I just used a comment to, like, comment out this print statement because I don't want it to run. I want to keep the code around because I may want to, like, restore it later. But by, by uh, commenting it out, you can, toggle, you can toggle it so that it won't run on this execution. Or any execution until you fix it. So, help. What did I call that function? Intersect. There we go. Um, Python, th Python, Python, three, topic one dot pi. Ah, uh, I didn't save it. Did I not save it? Save. There you go. Ah, it expects it indented. All right. Okay. Save that. Yes. Um. Oh yeah, this is. Yeah, okay. 
man, it would be helpful if this was left in a state where it could have been easily compiled. There you go. Help on function intersect in module main. Intersect. It gives you the uh, it gives you the prototype, and then it says the information that you include in the doc string. This is cool. Like you've got all kind. Like basically all of the library help. All of the library functions have um, help uh, printed out for them. So if you did like help on print, you get uh, a, a fair amount of information about print and how it's used. You get out of this by pressing Q, by the way. There we go. So, um, yes. So, um, let's talk about Booleans. So, <laughs> Booleans, uh, this is a, um, for people who are not uh, programmers yet, you will be by the end of this course, but if you're not a programmer yet, the term Boolean is something that you may have heard um, in conjunction with uh, your high school statistics classes. Um, how, uh, because uh, Bool, uh, I, I forget what his name is, but there's some statistician whose name is, is Bool. Um, I'm sure the chat will jump in with that one too. But um, with Booleans, that just means true or false values. It turns out that in computing, it's very useful to have true and false values. It's useful to be able to store true and false values. Uh, you may remember where we were talking about conditions, and conditional statements. Well, um, the conditional statement of an if statement must evaluate to a Boolean value. So, Booleans are either tr true or false. So, you actually have, like, true is a, um, I think it's it must be capitalized, true is true. So, true is a literal. It's a literal the same way that 3 or 7 is a literal, and so is false. There you go. So, Oh, George Bool? Maybe. Hmm. For those who hate Python, Boolean conversion of X is slower than not not X. That's interesting. Thank you, Mark. So, um, how do we create Boolean values? Well, we've got a number of operators, which are called comparators, which will yield a Boolean value. So if we wanted to uh, inquire, if we had a, a value x is equal to 4 and a value y is equal to 6, we can perform various um, operations on these two values to determine, you know, how they compare. Um, are operators literals? No, operators are operators. Literals are literals. Um, x is, so x, is x equal to y? False. Is x less than or equal to y? Yes. Is it less than y? Yes. Is x greater than y? False. Is x greater than or equal to y? False. Is x not equal to y? That's true. Not equal is the same as saying not x equals y. Um, so, Uh, the slide says that it only compares instant floats, um, but it can compare lots and lots of different things, yes. So uh, we're go actually going to see as we get into object-oriented things that you can overload these operators for any type of class that you would want to make, but that's, you know, get, uh, getting quite ahead of where we are right now. For now, yes, you should just think of them as tests, um, tests for... Um, equality and, you know, ordering. Equality and inequality in particular is applied very, like, widely throughout uh, throughout the language. So, like, for example, if I had a list 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, are these two lists equal to each other? Yes. 
is the string hello equal to the string not hello, then it's not. So there you go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're going to get to the more pure Boolean operations as well. Don't worry. Um, somewhere. Where does that come in? Right at the end. Well, that's funny. Okay, I'm going to do like the last... Since it follows on nicely, I'm going to do these operators now as well. So if you want to, like, so you also, in addition to comparison operators, you have uh, what are called logical operators. Um, this is, uh, you know, as you go on in computer science, once you take your uh, discrete math courses in second year, you will become familiar with a system of reasoning called propositional logic. Uh, it's reasonably easy to understand as it maps quite nicely onto uh, various intuitions you may have about how logical systems work. But uh, essentially, we have uh, two main logical operators and a, um, an extra one. So we have and. True and true is true. True and false is false. False and false is false. So in order for the logical conjunction or and operator to come out true, you have to have both of the things that went into it be true. So this and that must be true in order for this and that to be true. Or works a little bit differently, but not only slightly differently. With or, true or true is true. True or false is true. False or false is false. So in, in the case of the or operator, one or the other of the two statements that you put together have to be um, true in order for the result to be true. So one or the other of them. It takes both of them being false for an OR operator to come out false. So here's an example. Um, we have x. x is equal to 4. Let's see if x is greater than or, uh, greater than 2 and x is less than 10. True. What about x is greater to, than 2 and x is greater than 10? That's false in the current case, but if we set x equal to 12, then that becomes true, right? So Boolean operators, these uh, also known as logical operators, So XOR is one that you will rarely see, but uh, it's still kind of interesting. The XOR operator, only uh, it only returns true if the two inputs are different. So um, true XOR true is false. True XOR false is true. And false x or false is false. And uh, with all of these example I've, examples I've done, you can switch these uh, and get the same result. That is another way of saying logical operators are commutative. <clears throat> they have the property of commutation, just like the commutator in an electric motor. Um, yes. So, I'll just jump back to Booleans now. <clears throat> so, very quickly, it should be... I, I've mentioned this a couple of times in class before, but it's important to understand the difference between a single equal sign and a double equal sign. And this is uh, true in most programming languages. Some of them pick out one versus the other based on context, but most of them 
uh, you need to understand the distinction. When you have two equal signs, you are testing for equality. When you have one equal sign, you are performing assignment. <clears throat> so, one equal sign is an instruction. Two is a test. So this makes the variable a contain the value four. And um, this evaluates to true or false. There's really like, the, the only way to like really get it is to mess it up a few times and have the, com have the interpreter complain at you and then have to fix it. That's the only way to really get a lot of this. Like that's actually true for like most of what we're talking about here. Um, the thing about programming in general is that you need to do it to get it, right? There's only so much you're going to pick up from me in this lecture. You need to actually get out into the field and try it out. Because you'll, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the immortal words of Miss Frizzle, you will, uh, you will make mistakes and you will get messy. Uh, and that is the only way to learn. So, yes, good. So let's talk about functions. So what is a function? We've been using functions. Um, ah, I have a question. Is or an implicit statement, and is XOR an explicit statement, since both values cannot be equal? Um, and could I explain XOR one more time? So, no, none of, none of or or XOR is our statements. They are expressions. So, um, one of the things that I use this interpreter for is to process expressions, right? Um, I have a few statements in here, but I can just see what the value of an expression is. Now, that said, if you wanted to say, like, b is equal to x, or, uh, uh, you know, false x or true. Oh, it's with the caret character. There. And there we go. So that is that is a, that is an expression which is inside of a statement, right? Um, yes. So XOR only returns true when the inputs are different. Uh, when they're the same, it outputs false. So. <clears throat> A way of grouping together a sequence of op so what is a function right we've been talking about functions uh, a fair amount you know you've seen me write functions but like let's uh, let's dive into the idea let's define it somewhat more formally or more rigorously in computing one of the things that was observed early on in computing is that it's a pain in the butt to have to repeat yourself when you're writing a program, we try to write our programs so that they are maximally useful. But what it means to be maximally useful is it means that your, your program can be used multiple times under different scenarios. Um, so what we have in Python and in a large number of other languages is a unit of abstraction called the function. The function allows us to take statements of the language, group them together, specify outputs and inputs to it, and we can refer to the function name rather than having to repeat all of the statements of the function uh, in the program itself. Whenever you're programming and you're noticing that you're using copy and paste, to copy pieces of your of your code to other parts of your code. You should not do that. You should use a function instead. Universally. In theory, there should be no reason to copy, pay, copy and paste your code. Um, in practice, it's going to happen, but, you know. Um, copy with modification... Like, the, the less modification you do to something after you've copied it, the more likely it is that you should actually be writing a function. So, 
the way that functions work and the reason they're called functions is, the, is that they're similar in concept to the mathematical functions that you'll all know and love from all of your math courses. Things like cosine, exponentiation, and logarithms. So here is the syntax of a function. A function is declared using the def keyword. You then specify the name of the function and a list of input variables in round braces, comma, uh, separated. That's round brace delimited, comma, separated. We then have a colon. The rest of the body of the function, you kick it out one, or... There we go. Trying to get it. There we go. You kick it out one way, uh, one tab, and everything that's at that tab level is inside of the function. At the end of the function, it is normal and correct to have a return statement. The return statement takes one of the variables or values produced by your function, and it specifies that as being the output. So the output is the thing that the function returns to the thing that called it. So, um, yeah. For example, um, I'm going to start up a new file for topic two. Get it, topic two dot pi. There we go. So I am writing a function, def function, Pythagoras. It shall take a B and uh, yeah, we want to calculate the hypotenuse. So C is equal to A to the power of two. Oh. All my buttons are like the these. Key, I'm still getting used to the keyboard. Plus B squared. Return the square root of c, which, as all you math whizzes know, is uh, c raised to the power of one half. So there you go, Pythagoras, Pythagorean theorem. This is the return result. So if I wanted to store the return result into a variable, say x, I could say what is the Pythagore what is the result of Pythagoras called on uh, three and four. And then I could use that result or just print it. Um. Python 3 topic 2 dot pi. So the result is 2.5.0. Er, now, because I've encapsulated this inside of a function, I can run Pythagoras any number of times on different variables, or storing them in the same variable, or just directly printing the result. I can run it on 59 and 14. I can run it on this big number and that big number. Uh, and should I also print y? Huh? Uh huh. There we go. And there you go. We get our results. So it encapsulates. Um, it encapsulates the calculation, right? And you could say, oh well, you know, this is a one-liner. It's trivial to write a pro write a function for such a small. Uh, for such a small operation that you can perform in one line. And it's like, yes, that's true. Uh, but imagine if your, uh, if this pro this sub program was like 50 or 100 lines of code. That you certainly wouldn't want to uh, be repeating. So. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, 
Mr. Freshly Squeezed says, sometimes the, uh, sometimes the variables are omitted. What does that mean? So if the variables are om omitted and it's just open close brace, what that means is that the thing takes no inputs. This is occasionally, like, this is occasionally useful, but you won't see much of it in this class. In this class, um, in order to hook the uh, your solutions to the assignments up to the auto grader, it is 100% necessary for us to be able to feed inputs into them. Uh, in order for that to be the case, um, you know, there have to be inputs specified. The, um, uh, shall we say, ugh, when we when you do an assignment, you will only be rarely required to come up with this line yourself. Normally, we'll give it to you because if you screw it up, then you get zero. So, you know, we give it to you. So, assert um, assert Pythagoras three four equals five would return true for this function, assuming the function is working properly. Um, well, it wouldn't return true. It would fail to produce an exception. But you're, ju you're jumping ahead, like, at least a month and a half from where we are in the course right now. Um, so, functions. There we go. Yes. So here's an interesting point. Some of you may be used to uh, a certain syntax for multiplication, um, which I, I'm about to disabuse you of that notion. Python 3, there we go. So, when you're doing math, regular math, math math, uh, like math on paper, it's conventional to write uh, multiplication, omitting the mu actual multiplication operator when it's being applied to <clears throat> when it's being applied to something like a polynomial, right? If you try to do that in Python, you'll get a name. Well, uh, let me just define x because that's not the error we were supposed to get. There we go. We get an error. Int object is not callable. So when you when you have this form of syntax, whenever you have a name and then open round brace that tells the computer you're trying to call a function. If you're trying to call a function that's not actually a function, but a, a literal, like three, uh, that's an error. So if you want to do multiplication, you must, must, must explicitly insert the multiplication operator. Um, this is just one of those little gotchas that you have in programming. So, good. Now we can talk about tuples. Tuples are a little... So, are you confused yet? <laughs> are, you conf are you confused yet? Because we're about to make things more complicated. So. Up to now, we have been dealing with variables that occur exclusively uh, on their own. So a, a variable is capable of storing a number or a float. It's useful, it turns out it's extremely useful, to be able to group data together. So we have in, in uh, I almost said in Haskell, what we have in Python is a, um, uh, we have various aggregate data types. So they're aggregate because they aggregate things together, and they are uh, data types because they are, uh, you know, separately defined data types. Good. Haven't lost nobody no, too much. Good. We're we're doing good so far. So, a tuple is a is a list of objects. So it is a sequence of numbers or values, literals. Um, can tuples contain tuples? Tuples absolutely can contain tuples. Tuples are one of the things tuples can contain. Uh, if I was being pedantic about it, I would say tuples can be recursively defined. Recursion is a word you're going to have to learn the meaning of. So, we have a tuple. 
There we go. Tuple. It contains the values 1, 2, 3, and 4. It doesn't have to. We could have uh, an element that's not in a sequence. You know, we could say rude people just for reasons. And then that could be in there too. So tuple, uh, what's going to distinguish tuples from some of the other aggregate data types that we talk about uh, are various properties, one of which is um, a property as, as one of your colleagues says, uh, immutability. Uh, a, a tuple is immutable and lists are mutable, but we're again getting ahead of things. So when you put things into a tuple, they get associated with a particular index. The items in a tuple stay in the order that you put them in. Uh, this It might seem strange that that's a property, but as we're going to see with some of the aggregate data types, that's not actually something you can rely on. So t at 1 is 2. t at 0 is 1 in this case. So one of the things that uh, a lot of people have difficulty wrapping their noodle around uh, when they um, when they first learn what like when they first learn this stuff is the fact that um, when you try to access the elements of a tuple, you start numbering at zero rather than one. It's called zero indexing. Um, there are complicated reasons uh, for why zero indexing is the way that more or less every single computer language ever numbers the elements of its data structures. Uh, it has to do with complicated stuff that I will teach you, I promise, in 1xc3 once we talk about pointers. For now, you just need to remember that things start at zero. I have a question. What is the difference between a tuple and a list? Uh, lists are mutable. Tuples are immutable. That is the primary. That is the primary difference. We're going to get into what constitutes mutability and immutability in topic four. So again, we are jumping ahead quite a lot right now, but uh, I have to try to teach the course in order to some degree. So here are some basic operations on tuples. If you want to retrieve the i plus one element of a tuple, then you use square braces. This is also, you will hear me sometimes refer to this as the indexing operation. If you wish to concatenate two tuples, you do it with the plus sign. So this is a very early, um, this is a very early uh, instance of a interesting phenomenon we have in computing called polymorphism. You don't have to know what polymorphism is yet, but it's important for you to have heard the word before you try to learn what it is. So basically, when you have the plus sign applied to integers, it's addition. When you have the plus sign applied to aggregate data types, like tuples, it concatenates them. That is to say, it puts one and the other and it clicks them together. Just like, uh, just like making your uh, submarine modules click together in the new Subnautica game. Concatenation. Like, it's like putting trains together. Um, so... But the trick is that um, the plus operator itself has different meanings depending on its context. For those of you who are language buffs, that means that Python is not a context-free language. It is not, you cannot specify Python with a context-free grammar. Context will determine the semantics of various operations. So this is what's called polymorphism. Polymorphism, poly meaning many, morph 
meaning shape. So it's many shaped. It does different things depending on, you know, depending on its its positionality within the uh, within the code. So I just wanted to to say the word polymorphism. Um, does this work for all types of data? It works for some. It so it works for the types of data for which this def this operator has been defined. That's the thing about polymorphism is that the, all of the definitions have to be hiding somewhere. So um, if you have uh, more one of the more exotic um, uh, data structures we'll be dealing with, which is called a set, you'll see that the plus operator is unsupported for operands of type set and set. So it doesn't always work on everything. There are things for which it's defined and things for which it's not defined. It's not universally defined. However, um, yeah, it works. It, it, it does work on tuples. Um, so, does 1, 2, 3, 4, oop, plus a b work? Yes, it does. Uh, with a tuple, it doesn't care what the data type is of the thing that's in the tuple. Does polymorphism mean the, mean the same operator slash method behave differently depending on their use? Yes. Um, yes, indeed. Um, there is a more, like, there's a more rigid definition of it when you're talking about object-oriented stuff particularly. Um, we have various types of polymorphism. Um, however, for the moment, like polymorphism, you should know what the term means, and it's all like all polymorphism means is the thing does different things depending on what's applied to it. <clears throat> yeah, it also works for strings. That's true. So we also have a length operator, which is very quick, very simple. All L E N gives us is the number of elements in the thing. So this has six elements. If you want to search, you use in. So, is two in this true? Is potato in that false? So, <clears throat> in will tell you, like, it's a test. It's a searching operation. Um, yeah. Um, so, Roger has, like, a strange type of bracket that's round on the inside and square on the outside. Um, no, as far as I'm aware, the, 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 that particular type of brace is not used inside of programming. If you want to perform the Boolean negation of the search operation, you simply put the not keyword in there. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know whether the length function is big O of n or not. It's possible that, uh, because in, because in Python everything is being stored as a class, it's possible that the class is keeping track of the length of the thing as it's being formed. So it's possible that it's just looking up some value that's being stored by Python and that it's not actually uh, counting the number of elements in it. However, something like a search or a sort operation, those certainly would be big O of n. Quick question. Polymorphism is essentially using functions from a separate class into the main program. Um, no. Polymorphism is when a function does different things depending on what it's applied to. So if plus, if this plus operator is our function, it does different things when you apply it to integers versus tuples. Therefore, polymorphic. <clears throat> so, there you go. Um, I think that we're going to, um, we're going to call it there. Um, thank you very much for uh, listening in. If you have any quick questions, I'll take a quick question or two, but I got to get to my next class. <clears throat> yeah, length is big O1. Good, okay. Uh, we're confusing the people who don't know what big O is. 
don't worry, we'll we'll go over um, this. They're talking about the um, how long it takes for the algorithm to execute relative to the number of uh, elements it's executing over. So we're going to get into it. You don't have to know that yet. <clears throat> Um, okay. Sir, will the tests and exam be based on coding or on these lectures? They will be based on coding. They'll be much more similar to the assignment material. Uh, you won't be expected to memorize stuff off of the slides. However, everything in the slides is supposed to help you um, program better. So, the you know, these lectures hypothetically are still useful. Um... Can I please state a scenario where you don't want the data to be mutable? Uh, when you when speed and efficiency is the thing that you're looking for. Uh, the thing about mutability and mutable data is that it is a lot more resource intensive to maintain a mutable data structure than an immutable data structure. So, um, so that's the reason. You know, reasons related to efficiency or permanence. Um, when you're applying the length of function, it says you're, it only you're, it only applies to one argument. You're probably missing an extra set of braces. You're probably doing something like that, right? But that's not a tuple. You're confusing the round braces that delimit the tuple for the round braces that call the function. So there you go. Does the exam have the same format as the tests? Yes. All right. Take her easy, folks. Um, I'll see you guys tomorrow. In the meantime, just chill. Today, today is a chill day. So you should try to chill at some point.